What has no beginning, middle or end, but is always present? It's time, a constant and unstoppable force in all of our lives that can't be controlled, right? But in the 19th century, that's exactly what happened. Time was given rules and standardised and became the system that we use today. Before smartphones, before digital clocks, before trains ran on strict schedules, time itself was chaos. Different towns and cities had their own local times based on the position of the sun. All this changed right here at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich in London, home of the Prime Meridian. I'm here today to unearth the story of how GMT, that's Greenwich Mean Time, was born and how we brought time under control. What time is it right now? Well, it depends how you measure it. First, we have solar time, which is measured by the position of the sun in the sky. When the sun is at its highest point, it's noon. But here's the problem. Solar time isn't consistent. The Earth's orbit isn't a perfect circle and its axis is tilted. That means that the length of a day can vary by up to 30 seconds. That's where mean time comes in. Instead of relying on the sun, mean time is based on the average length of the day over the course of a year. This keeps clocks running smoothly without daily variations. In the past, the difference between these two methods was causing chaos at sea. And it was a problem that astronomer John Flamsteed was grappling with right here at Greenwich in the 17th century. In 1675, King Charles II had established the Royal Observatory here in Greenwich to solve the problem of navigation at sea, which would help sailors determine their location more accurately. And for that, time needed to be brought into check. The King appointed John Flamsteed as the first astronomical observator, and Flamsteed was instructed to imply himself with the most exact care and diligence to the rectifying of the tables of the motions of the heavens and the places of the fixed stars, so as to find out the so much desired longitude of places for the perfecting of the art of navigation. Here at the Royal Observatory, Flamsteed House takes its name from the first royally appointed astronomer. This is the oldest part of the site and was originally designed by architects Sir Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke for the observator's habitation and a little for pomp. I'm here in the Octagon Room, the oldest part of the Royal Observatory. With its high windows, eight-sided shape and multiple south-facing views, the Octagon Room gave first astronomer John Blamsteed a panoramic view of the night sky. We can imagine him setting up different instruments to carry out observations from each window. Now, one of Flamsteed's first major tasks here at Greenwich was to solve the longitude problem. Though mechanical clocks had been in use since the 13th century, when ships were at sea, there were many things that could affect them. Rolling waves, changes in temperature and small variations in gravity at different latitudes would play havoc with the running of early timekeeping devices. By the time of Flamsteed's appointment, a ship's location of north to south, its latitude, was relatively easy to find for any skilled sailor. They would chart the height of the sun or the positions of the stars. But longitude, finding where ships were on their east to west axis, was much more complicated. Without knowing their longitude, every time they left port, ships were at risk of getting lost or even shipwrecked. Finding longitude required knowing both the time aboard a ship and the time at a known reference point, such as the home port, so that the difference in hours could be converted into distance. As solar time would be different at each, there was no average point to be referenced. As part of his work, Flamsteed had studied the motions of the stars and the sun. Using precise observations, he created tables that smoothed out daily and seasonal variations in the measurement of time and predicted the average or mean position of the sun at any given time of year. 
This produced an average mean 24-hour day that could be used with a mechanical clock all year round. Flamsteed's tables were a game changer for navigation. By using mean solar time calculated here at Greenwich, GMT became the world standard time at sea. And there's no site better that tells this story of the Royal Observatory's crucial role in keeping time at sea than the distinctive time ball. Every day at precisely 1pm, this red time ball drops from the top of the Royal Observatory. It's one of the oldest public time signals in the world, dating back to 1833. Even today, ships on the Thames can still use it to check their timepieces. I'm joined by Louise Devoy, Senior Curator here at Greenwich. Louise, tell us more about the time ball. Yes, here we have the time ball on the northeast turret of Flamsteed House, the oldest part of the observatory. Now from down here in the courtyard, it looks quite small, but it's actually about five feet or one and a half meters across. And originally it was just a hollow wooden sphere covered in black canvas or fabric. And then it was replaced with the red aluminum version that you can see here. Now, over time, we've had to adapt the technology over the two centuries. So first of all, it was wound up by a hand crank. Then from the 1850s, it was controlled by electric impulses from the Shepherd motor clock then later controlled by radio signals. And then now it's actually dropped by GPS time signals from the satellites as they pass overhead. So it's really evolved with the technology. And our position here near the river is really important for ships even today, isn't it? Yes, it's position here and the view down to the river is really crucial. You want to look at the time ball, see it drop and check your chronometer and see if it's too fast or too slow. And then factor that into your longitude calculations. So time balls changed the game for maritime navigation. But on land, time was still causing chaos. Before the 19th century, time was a local affair. Towns continued to set their clocks based on solar noon, the sun's highest point in the sky. This meant that the time in London could be different from the time in Bristol, Cardiff or Edinburgh. A difference of minutes might not seem like much, but as the world grew smaller with new technologies, this was a problem that needed to be solved. When the railways arrived in the 1830s and 40s, the steam engine revolutionised travel, but it also exposed a critical issue. Each station was operating on its own local time. One man behind the push for unified time was this man, Sir George Biddle Airy, the seventh Astronomer Royal here at Greenwich. Appointed Astronomer Royal in 1835, Airy was a brilliant mathematician and scientist who made major improvements to astronomical observations at the observatory. He also established a new meridian at Greenwich in 1851. But wait a minute, what is a meridian? Well, it's a fixed line drawn around the globe, passing through two poles and a fixed point on the Earth's surface. Airy's meridian at Greenwich is today marked by a metal line fixed into the Royal Observatory courtyard, and at night it's marked by a laser beam. The beam originates from a point above the airy transit circle, the telescope used to determine the meridian. We know of four other meridians at the observatory, three of them are actually still marked, but Aries would go on to be the most important. And it's his line, the Prime Meridian, that has become the prime reference of longitude for sailors and map makers. Establishing the Prime Meridian here at Greenwich wasn't the only thing that Airy was responsible for. Louise, what do we have here? So this clock behind me, this is the public face of Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. We saw the airy transit circle where those critical measurements of the sun and stars were made to create GMT. Now you want to share it. So in 1852, Airy installed a new clock, the Shepherd Motor Clock, that was designed by Charles Shepherd, a local clockmaker here in London. And this consisted of a motor clock that sent electric impulses to a whole network of connected dials known as sympathetic or even slave dials. And this is the most public facing one of them. So this is a really important symbol in showing how time was shared with the nation. Absolutely. So with the railways, you have a variation of about 30 minutes across the country from east to west. 
So it just became incredibly confusing and people wanted to rely on time signals coming from the observatory. So this system was set up uh, and it worked really well. And it also meant that GMT was becoming useful to more people, not just astronomers or navigators, but now everyone across the whole country. With Britain leading the way in timekeeping, a bigger question emerged. How to set a global standard? In other words, how do we make sure that everyone around the world is operating using the same time? In October 1884, delegates from 25 nations gathered at the International Meridian Conference in Washington, D.C. Their aim? To agree on one point that would serve as the world's reference for navigation and timekeeping. The front runner to become the prime meridian of the world, zero degrees longitude, was a line right here at Greenwich, which had been defined by a telescope designed by George Airy. At the 1884 conference, 22 countries voted in favour of the Greenwich Meridian. With the majority vote, it was decided that the crosshairs in the eyepiece of Aries telescope would indicate zero degrees longitude and the start of the universal day. From that moment on, Greenwich was officially chosen as the prime meridian, the point from which all world time zones would be measured. Greenwich, meantime, served the world well for years, right up until 1972. So what changed? GMT is based on the rotation of the Earth, which isn't perfectly steady. This meant it was unreliable for the precise timing needed for emerging science and technology. But in the 1960s, new atomic clocks revolutionised timekeeping. These clocks measure time based on the vibrations of atoms, making them millions of times more accurate than traditional clocks. In 1967, the world officially adopted Coordinated Universal Time, that's UTC, which uses atomic clocks rather than the Earth's rotation. And in 1972, UTC officially replaced Greenwich Mean Time as the international standard. However, because the Earth's rotation still matters for daily life, UTC is occasionally adjusted by adding or subtracting leap seconds. These are a bit like leap years, extra time added to keep things synchronised. The leap second holds time for around one second, allowing the Earth's rotation to catch up and ensuring that UTC and solar time don't drift too far apart. And the evolution of time isn't over. There is an ongoing debate. Should we get rid of leap seconds? There are also debates about the time on the moon. This will be important if we ever establish a base there. How should we calculate the moon's time zones? Should we just use UTC? But among all these debates, there's still a home for GMT. While UTC is now the main time standard used around the world to regulate clocks and time, GMT is the legal time in Britain in the winter, used by the Met Office, the Royal Navy and the BBC World Service. And here in South East London, the Royal Observatory at Greenwich remains the symbolic home of global time. So the next time you check your watch or your phone screen, Remember that the system that keeps the world ticking was born right here.